Hello, and welcome to the Aerospace Ambition Podcast, hosted by myself, Kieran, a PhD researcher from the University of Bristol, focusing on reducing aircraft emissions and their environmental impact this decade, and Marius, an aerospace engineer from Munich, deeply committed to sustainability. In this episode, we explore the prospect of reaching true net zero climate impact in the aviation sector, with a special focus on sustainable aviation fuels and control management. So, Marius, can you tell us about our guest today? Hi, Kieran, and yes, I'm very excited about our guest today. On this episode, we have the pleasure of welcoming Nikhil Sashdeva, a principal at Roland Berger's office in London. With a strong focus on the aviation sector, Nikhil's expertise lies in supporting the transition to more climate-friendly technologies. He has worked with major players in the aerospace and aviation industries, including OEMs, suppliers, governmental bodies and airlines. With a master's in aerospace engineering from Imperial College and an MBA from Harvard Business School, Nikhil brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table. Join us as we discover how Nikhil is helping his clients push the boundaries and make the world a better place. Hi and welcome Nikhil. Hello Marius, hello Karen. It's a great pleasure to be able to speak with you about this wonderful topic. Well, likewise, it's a pleasure to host you. And uh, first off, I'd like to start with a small personal question. So we spoke a couple of months ago already. I was fascinated by your study presented at uh, COP27. So for our listeners, that's a UN climate change conference. And I was particularly interested in your takeaways. And we also, we're going to touch upon that a little bit later, as well as the most recent study at COP28. But what we also discussed together was potential ways for me to have an impact, uh, right, for um, aviation climate mitigation. And uh, you pointed out in a perfect and very clear manner, like these are the options, these are the pros and cons uh, with every uh, pathway. So I'm going to turn the question around. Now, you chose one path and uh, you're currently at Roland Berger. You've been there for quite a while. So uh, what made you decide to join this journey? And uh, what are some of the pros and cons of this particular journey uh, that you experience on a daily level? No, that's a great question. What I think I can, I can say is the ultimate goal for all three of us, which is to see this great industry become more sustainable. Why am I choosing to pursue it as a consultant of all things? Why not a technologist or uh, actually working at an airline rather than working as a consultancy? I think that's a good question. The, the, the fascinating thing is the industry is undergoing a disruption as we speak. This is not like a disruption in the software, sector, which, you know, six months in, all of a sudden everything has changed. This is the aviation sector. It takes decades for things to move in this, in this industry. And that's for good reason. That's because we need things to be safe. We need things to be, ideally, a good business case. And everything needs to make sense. But we cannot underestimate the disruptive impact of the sustainability transition. And when the disruption happens, every player, whether it's an aerospace company making new aircraft, which it doesn't know whether airlines will want to buy, or whether it's an airline thinking about how to become sustainable and has no clue which fuels and which aircraft to buy, or which airports to work with, or whether you're an airport with your uncertainties, whether you're a leasing company with your uncertainties, there's a great deal of uncertainty. And the, the costs between the different value chain players are unknown. Do we know what a future hydrogen aircraft will actually cost? Do we know how it will be to operate? We have no clue right now. It's in this strange uncertainty that exists during disruptions where actually a third party like a consultancy can add a lot of value. Mm. So where myself and my team at Roland Berger focus is in helping the different players translate their problems clearly with each other so that we may reduce these uncertainties and hopefully hasten the change. And by being able to work with an aerospace company one day, with an airline the other day, with an airport another day, with a fuel producer making SAF at, at one point in time, that allows us to be able to add value for the collective ecosystem, not just an individual plan. That's very interesting. Yeah. Thanks for that, Nikhil. So your, your team and you at Roland Berger, you've, you've released quite a lot of really important and crucial studies over the past few years, with the latest being the circular SAF study. Um, so we'd just like to know what, what really is circular SAF and what is the biggest misconception about SAF which you encounter on a regular basis? And maybe just a, a short introduction into 
what SAF is. So it's sustainable aviation fuel. Just a, a sentence or two would be wonderful. <laughs> right. So sustainable aviation fuel is, uh, is it's, a, it's a technology that by its very nature allows a sustainable production of aviation fuels, right? That's in the name. But what does that mean? It means that in the production process, you suck carbon out of the air. Mm -hmm. An equivalent amount of carbon that ends up going into the fuel, that ends up being in the wings of the plane and ends up getting burned, and then re-released into the atmosphere. But because it was sucked out of the air to begin with, that's a closed loop. If we could switch, let's say we had a magic wand and we could switch the SAF overnight, 100% everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. lots of things would have to change, but let's say we can do it. We don't need any more conventional kerosene. We don't need food oil making kerosene anymore. That's the wondrous thing about SAF. You still get CO2 coming out of the plane. I really have to clarify that. You still have CO2 coming out of the plane, but the net impact is zero. Sure. But what's the biggest misconception about SAF? And I'm dealing with this with multiple clients uh, at any point in time. It's really something that's a big misconception. People think of SAF as a new technology. That's very early stage. That's not true. Mm -hmm. SAF is nothing that the scientists in and the research labs need to do the bulk of the work for. Yes, there's, of course, new technologies. There's new catalysts that can be made. There's, there's new production processes. You can make SAF better. But SAF exists. It, it can already be made. The real issue in SAF is industrialization. Is getting the funding in, building the business cases for huge multi-billion dollar SAF production facilities and getting the funding rolled out and getting these facilities built so that we see a reduction in, in, in the cost of SAF over time, just like we did for solar and just like we did for wind. So SAF is at, is, is at the point that I would say maybe solar was maybe 20 or 25 years ago in that it existed. The technology was there. The basics were understood. That's not to say that it was the best type of solar. I mean, solar has had such wonderful innovation. SAF will as well, I'm sure, and I really hope it does. But we are in the stage that we should start deploying. It. We need to deploy and we need to start using. And that's going to be the biggest lever. And this is a misconception. Let's just get into it and it will get cheaper. It'll get more affordable. And the, and the, and the technology will, will, will improve as well. Now, the circular SAF, right? The question that we asked ourselves was, if you, if you take a big step back, there's multiple ways you can make you can make SAF. The long-term solution that everyone talks about, which really would be wonderful, is power to liquid SAF, right? You capture CO2 out of the air directly through carbon capture, and you, uh, you get hydrogen through electrolysis, and you combine them through the Fischer-Tropsch process and make SAF. Power to liquid, wonderful. But that's a bit expensive today, although there are some parts of the world where it could be affordable. Mm -hmm. Conversely, what is actually available in the market today is things like Hefa SAF made out of waste oils. And that is heavily feedstock constrained. In fact, there is even some type of SAF that's not very sustainable because sustainability is not just a function of carbon. It's also a function of how much land is required to actually make that SAF, how much water is needed to make that SAF, how much energy is needed to make that SAF. There's a, there's a whole set of issues on really looking at the sustainability of, of a given SAF. Sure. What we realized was waste feedstocks more broadly could be used to bridge this gap between today's early stage SAF and tomorrow's power to liquid. And the key conclusion that we found was that actually, if, again, we could wave a magic wand and all global waste, waste feedstocks that are applicable could actually be used to make SAF, we could have enough SAF until the late 2030s or the early 2040s in terms of demand. And that's huge because that's long enough to cross the, the gap that we have on, on power to liquid. Power to liquid is already possible in some places, but by the 2030s and 2040s, easily doable, right? We just need to deploy the capital and we need to, and, and we need to build it out. The ecosystem needs to be built. So waste staff can be this bridge. And that's the key insight from our COP28 study. So you're saying that, are you saying that we wouldn't necessarily have to rely on first generation biofuels? So basically growing crops to produce fuel, which may take up a lot of land, a lot of land use change would be necessary, which has its own uh, plethora of climate effects associated with that. Absolutely. Ethical concerns of growing crops, which could be fed to people in developing nations, whereas instead we're using it for aviation. So you're saying that 
waste SAFs could be this critical bridge to to satisfy the needs that we require absolutely up until the the 2040s was it you said up until the late 2030s or the early 2040s okay. depending on which part of the world you're in exactly right so if you're in the western world in europe the north in, in north america until the late 2030s local waste supply is actually enough sure if you're in the rest of the world where aviation is still being democratized but actually there's a lot of there are a lot of people, there's a lot of waste, there are big cities. Mm. In those areas, you can actually go until the early 2040s. But the critical thing with waste with waste to SAF is that, yeah, we, we exactly like you said, right? We live in a world in which there's a carbon crisis, but there's also a food crisis. There's also a water crisis. We can't be ignoring all the other crises. Yeah, We have to respect that aviation is not the most important thing. Maybe feeding people is actually more important than aviation, perhaps, sure. right? So let's not cause that that dissonance. Let's find a way that doesn't compete with with food crops. And actually, in that way, waste staff is very sustainable because not only does it remove carbon from the air in its production process, it is circular in that way. It also we we also get um, reduced emissions from landfill. Yeah. And as you probably know, waste in landfill can cause CO two emissions of its own, but also methane emissions, which is very potent greenhouse gases. Mm. So you can reduce the CO two and the methane emissions capture CO2 in the production process. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're putting CO2 back in the air, but it's circular and it reduces the need to uh, continue drilling for oil. That's very interesting. I want to get back to a point you mentioned regarding certainties or uncertainties and uh, your role as a consultancy um, in this ecosystem. Mm. Now, we're going to talk about contrail management in a bit, but uh, there is always this topic of uncertainty, right? And um, now with this life cycle assessment, there are so many small bits and pieces, you know, in this process chain. I'm just wondering, what is the certainty that you have when you put out such a study? And uh, when you make such clear recommendations, like, how would you put this in perspective, for example, um, with regards to contrail management regarding the um, uncertainty? Yeah, no, great question. Uh, let me address that on, on waste to staff first, and then let's get into contrails, where I would argue the uncertainty is even higher. So on on waste to staff, um, we we rely upon two things. Number one, we rely upon existing uh, demonstration plants that already exist, but also existing uh, work that's happening in other waste management sectors. So you can already get energy from waste, right? So it, it's not it's not that new to to find ways of utilizing waste. We're just saying maybe it can also be used for SAF. So there is there there are existing studies, existing data on the impact for each of these different these different building blocks. And that's how we feel quite confident making the big messages that, that, that we do in these kinds of studies, because we really back them up with academic research that, that we are building upon. And we back it up with, in, with industry discussions and industry data that we have access to through our work. Yeah. But moving to contrails, this is where it gets much more difficult. Contrails today mm -hmm. are understood to be net warming for the world. But actually, it's pretty complicated. Contrails, the streaks that you see in the sky, they're basically mirrors in the sky. They reflect radiation back out into space, which is actually a cooling effect. They also, re they also um, uh, reflect radiation back to the Earth, which is a warming effect, right? It prevents radiation being emitted. It's formation of basically what is a new cloud in the, in, in the sky. And it also varies by part of the world. It also varies by time of day. It also varies by season of the year. It's a really complex thing. The researchers working in this area who were, we actually have a panel of researchers that we that we work with on non-CO2 effects, including contrails and NOx, and we, we, we've we been working with them for uh, for uh, about a year and a half now, and they've, they've been really helpful to us. Mm -hmm. We understand that research is ongoing, and so we ask the question, are we at a point in the research that the industry can start taking action, yes or no? And that was the core question that we asked in our study at the Roadmap to True Zero, which we referenced earlier, that was published last year at COP27. Sure. The core question was, okay, we get it. Research is ongoing. It'll be a long time maybe until we have much more certainty about the exact impact of contrails, exactly how to measure it, exactly what the discrepancies are. Yeah. What we found, getting right to the answer, is that despite the uncertainty, the actions are clear. What we find is that regardless of where you position yourself if within the 95% confidence interval, of, well, controls could be much worse or they may not be all that bad. And they may be different in different parts of the world. And depending on how you measure them, their exact impact might be a little different. Wherever you are in that very wide envelope of uncertainty, 
the action that you have to undertake to do something about it is the same. You have to mitigate conflict. So what our big statement then was, and this was we we did something like a sensitivity analysis of something like 40 different cases before we before we got to this conclusion. Yeah. Our big takeaway there was, okay, good. Let's continue doing research into country of science. It's essential. But let's put more funding, not re-diversion of existing funding. There's not enough anyway, but more funding into now mitigation of contracts because we also have uncertainty in how to deal with them, right? Yeah. And in essence, it's it can be done through new technologies. SAF actually helps with contrails, but it doesn't solve the problem. Hydrogen aircraft may help with contrails, but they also might make it worse. What we find is the best way of mitigating contrails is better operations. And that's wonderful because you can do that now. You don't need SAF or you don't need hydrogen to start working on contrail mitigation. You can do it with existing technology, but we need better information. We need better coordination. And that's the critical juncture that where we are right now. Oh, that was so interesting because you uh, just started a couple of points uh, where I had questions anyways. Um, getting back to um, the science community right now. So you said that the certainty that you derive, one of the pillars is actually the um, scientific understanding, right? So so everything is based on science. However, with regards to contrail mitigation, you just pointed out your study. I want to make one step back. And what do you think the current scientific consensus is in the in the um, academic um, community regarding this operational implementation of contrail management? Yeah, it's a really interesting time. So we have certain voices that are very knowledgeable and extremely important to listen to that are warning against mitigation right now. Conversely, we also have a lot of voices that are saying, no, let's start trialing mitigation. Let's at least start trying to understand it. And actually, we, we seem to have enough data to start mitigating properly. And in this debate, there's what are, what are the, the topics in this debate, right? So the topics are the uncertainty in contrails themselves, the impact of CO2, because to mitigate contrails, there is a risk, in fact, quite a high risk, that at least there would be some increase in CO2, because you have to re-divert aircraft from an optimal route into a, an optimal route for the net impact, not just the CO2 or the contrail impact. So there might be a slight increase in CO2 to be able to mitigate that contrail. So there is a very important debate on, well, how do we really measure the relative impact of contrail versus CO2? They're completely different things, but they both cause warming. And if you take certain metrics, such as GWP20, global warming potential measured over 20 years, actually contrails are horrible as compared with, with CO2. So if you look at that, go ahead, do it right now. Yeah. But there's other metrics, GTP100, for example, which is global temperature potential over 100 years, in which actually you should be a bit more cautious. Maybe there's some contrails that can be mitigated and some that cannot. And so it becomes a bit more of a, well, we have to knife and fork through this. We have to really make sure that we're not making any mistakes. And then the third ingredient or topic in this debate is what about aerosols? So aerosols are other uh, emissions that come out of a plane. And we don't know the full impact of exactly what they do to the atmosphere, exactly what they do for, for, for climate change. They might be heavily cooling. They might be heavily warming. We don't yet get them. The uncertainty is so broad that actually this is where the scientific community still has to do a lot of, a lot of the legwork before the industrial community can actually take action. Yeah. So these are all important topics. What we're trying to do is, from a consultancy perspective, say, hang on, the EU ETS fund is now looking at perhaps allowing airlines some money to go trial control mitigation. The in, Another EU example is uh, we have the MRV scheme, which is saying that in a few years, we might perhaps have some degree of ETS, uh, basically taxation for all intents and purposes, carbon pricing for non-CO2 effects like NOx and maybe for countries. So for an airline or for an aerospace company or for an air traffic controller, Now is the time to start thinking about what impact you could have, to start measuring your own footprint. Because if you don't do that, you will be caught out when these changes finally do happen. Yeah. And frankly, this is, and for me, this is the critical reason why I personally land on the side of the debate that mitigation should be at least tested and trialed now, right? We also live in a world with tipping points. It's very nice to think about G GTP 100 and GWP 20 as equivalent. But they may not be if warming today 
causes um, methane to be released in, in Siberia. And all of a sudden, there's a tipping point that we, that we go over. So warming reduced now is extremely valuable, not just in the year 2100. Therefore, contrails, which actually can be actioned today, is something we should very much pursue. And that's my, my own personal opinion. That, that makes a lot of sense. And um, I'm trying to untangle this a little bit because you mentioned so many crucial points right here, very dense, the information. And um, since we have a diverse um, spectrum of listeners, I uh, just want to make sure. So the MRV scheme, maybe you can um, just briefly explain what this is and also um, briefly what your expectation with regards to a timeline is like, what do we know? Like what is what is, you know, set in stone already? What is about to come? And where does the speculation begin? So first of all, MRV is monitoring, reporting, and verification, right? It is basically the initial phase when uh, a regulatory body like the EU and, um, and all of its various uh, arms, right, wants to start understanding what it should even do when it comes to various issues. They would do an MRV. They would monitor, they would report, and they would verify. Now the MRV on non-CO2 has started, right? It, ha it has begun. A consultation process is going on. And in 2025, the actual monitoring and data gathering phase will start. By 2028, the EU plans to get to a decision on what they're going to do about non-CO2 events. 2025 is just next year. It's not far away. So getting a grip on, on understanding what these effects really are, especially for the larger carriers who have their own tools and resources to be able to help and do something about it, well, now, now seems to be a good time to do that. But at what point does this become real? In terms of euros and cents, it will not become real until 2028, is our understanding, which is still quite a few years away. But in aerospace and aviation terms, four years is, again, not that much. So and th thinking about how the studies would have to be done, and this is something that Roland Berger has been doing a lot of thinking on, because of the variations in contrails between the seasons, between different parts of the world, between how aircraft, aircraft actually fly, you can't just take a, a flight London to Paris and just do, okay, one flight is with control mitigation and one flight is without control mitigation. Let's see what happens. No, actually, it takes, a, it, takes, it takes some time. You need to set a baseline, and that baseline might take a year or two to even set for your own airline, for a given route, for an entire aviation ecosystem. And then you make amendments. But what are the amendments? There's actually many different mitigations you could even trial. So how do you know concretely if you've had an impact? Is it satellite data you use? Do you need to do the Google approach, which is a fascinating, interesting approach in which they're using AI to actually look at the impact of contrails and to be able to decipher, did something actually happen? And AI is actually helping us to, to figure out, okay, this is actually just a natural cloud. Oh, no, that's actually a contrail that that plane made, and it's associated with this particular journey. This is a really complex field. So 2028 might feel like a, a, some, some time away. It's actually not that long away at all, which is where we do say, okay, it's time to start thinking about action. Interesting. Before um, you, Kieran, ask a follow-up question, just as a teaser, um, we're going to speak uh, with Mark Shapiro from Perfect. Breakthrough Energy very soon. So Amazing. we can also shed a little bit more light on um, the things that you just alluded to with regards to you know the Google experiment, etc. Wonderful person to speak with. I'd be looking forward to listening to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So while we're on the topic of regulating contrails and contrail well, the expected policy that is hopefully going to come in in the next few years. I think that's it's quite a, an interesting time to talk about the idea of carrot and stick, so the, the carrot and stick debate. So for the listeners, this is the idea of either incentivizing contrail avoidance through financial means or penalizing contrail creation. So basically the idea of do we reward airlines for not creating contrails or do we penalize them for creating them in the first place? I'd just like to hear your opinion on on your perspective and maybe the, the wider perspective of Roland Berger on this question and maybe what factors might need to be taken into account when considering this debate. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a fascinating debate and there's sadly no clear answer right now. Uh, there's also no Roland Berger perspective on this. So this is what, what I'm about to say is my own perspective as someone looking at this topic right now. And for me, what are the considerations? First and foremost, this is a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. It's not even about what is the most effective regulation. It's actually a cultural issue, first and foremost. Historically, we tend to see North America and the US in particular using the carrot approach, 
right? It's more business friendly. So it feels at least. Whereas Europe typically tends to use the stick approach. Now, let's just talk about that for a second. The carrot approach, yeah. where are the funds actually coming from, right? The funds are still coming from taxpayers, but the funds are being collected by a small number of, of bodies. Hmm. So in essence, it can be a bit of a tax redistribution from the many to the few, if it's a carrot. Uh, okay. The stick approach is actually the opposite. The monies are being taken from, let's say, in inverted commas, the few. There's, of course, dozens of airlines that would need to pay for if, if this actually happened. So it's not very few at all. But it's, you know, it's still more concentrated. They're actually businesses. They have P&L accounts. They're not individual taxpayers. And then they're being reallocated to a wider pot that then gets used for many things, um, ideally for climate mitigation writ large. So if you just take that lens, actually, maybe the stick approach is better. Right. But I'll give you the counter argument because look at the Inflation Reduction Act in America. As soon as that was announced, clients of ours, mm -hmm. companies we know doing carbon capture, doing hydrogen electrolysis, decided, oh, well, we're going to relocate our company from Europe to the US. So the stick approach is a disincentive. The carrot approach is an incentive. So by bringing in the Inflation Reduction Act, whatever the impact might be on the taxpayer, et cetera, et cetera, actually, America might have just given itself a major GDP and, and, and economic boost with a trillion dollar incentive, which ultimately will give money back to the same taxpayer by growing GDP and GDP per capita. So what is good for an economy? That's something that's way beyond, way above my pay grade. Let's put it that way. All right. But these are the considerations. Now, bringing it back to contrails, hmm. it's probably going to be a bit of both, right? Until such time as there is a scheme like the MRV, I would bet airlines will actually try to get a step ahead on this game. And that's really a self-administered carrot. Because if you are able to mitigate your contrails and do it, let's say, by 2026, not by 2028, not only do you learn how to mitigate contrails before the MRV scheme comes in and any potential ETS implications come in, mm -hmm. which is eventually a good thing to avoid a stick, but you also give yourself the carrot of a potential PR boost that, look, you've actually had real impact. So I would bet that airlines yep. and all of the ecosystem around them, whether it's ANSPs, air traffic controllers, whether it's service providers, whether it's you know information providers and satellite, satellite companies providing the data, the entire ecosystem that's required for this, I would bet that they will not wait around until a tax comes in, until a stick comes in, yeah. that they will see that actually acting on this is a good thing beyond just prevention of cost. That's at least what I'd like to see happen. Yeah, it's definitely a big PR thing. And, and it's really interesting that you point out the whole social, yeah. social justice side of it as well. That Absolutely. And, and carrot or stick will have huge implications on society as a as a whole and not just the industry. It's it's also about the users, the end users and the consumers as well. They will be yeah. affected by such policies. Absolutely. And, 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 and just to be clear, that's not just about controls. That's every incentive scheme sure. anywhere in the world has those kinds of macroeconomic implications, right? Yeah, yeah. But what I, what, what I want to clarify on the PR side is PR, you know, should not be considered a bad thing. It's bad if it's empty, right? If, you, if you're getting PR by not actually doing anything, that's bad. That's basically greenwashing. That's very bad. And we always make sure our clients stay away from that. But if you've actually done something real, you've had a positive impact in a measurable way, and you can demonstrate that you've done it, well, why should you not get good PR from that? You should. You deserve it. And that's the kind of PR I'm talking about. Yeah. I think the aviation industry probably needs something like that <laughs> uh, because for so long it's had this negative stigma associated it just due to the, the, the pure optics of it. And one question I asked myself as well, when, when I, I, I love the term self-administered um, carrot, <laughs> I've never heard that, but it makes a lot of sense uh, the way you explain it. Is there anything we can learn from um, the past in terms of how airlines uh, then react? So you just made the case that it makes sense to be proactive, right? Yet it's a very low margin game, uh, has always been and then um, recently shattered by uh, the pandemic. Uh, so is there anything um, or what, what gives you that confidence that they would act, uh, you know, um, ahead of regulation? It's still a very competitive marketplace. And, you know, I think Europe is still leading the way in a way, but uh, consumers are increasingly becoming more conscious of these issues. 
And, you know, in this highly competitive marketplace, anything you can do to improve your positioning uh, relative to, to, to the competition. And obviously, there's dozens of different ways you could do that. You could do it by having a cheaper price. You could do it by, by having a nicer seat. You could have, you do it by having a better customer experience. Well, you can also do it by being more sustainable. And we think that's a wonderful way of doing it, especially in a, in a world in which people are more conscious of these issues. And we're, we seem to be getting to a point that consumers are now willing to pay for sustainability. There, there is still what, what we call a say-do gap, right? Customers will, will say they'll pay, but when it actually comes to clicking the button, they won't actually, yeah. actually pay. But we've done a lot of work on this in the past year or two. Um, yeah, since 2022, we've been we've done several projects in this area, and there are ways in which some types of consumers, especially corporate consumers and freight customers, which is a huge part of the aviation sector, are actually willing to pay for the airlines to become more sustainable because it helps them in turn. Where where it comes to the average traveler, not as willing to pay yet, but there are mechanisms for doing it. Now, it's not to say that airlines should only act if customers are willing to pay. That would be incorrect. But it is to say that there is evidence that customers will reward you for being more sustainable. And final point on this, uh, I think there's a generational impact, right? So if you look at Gen Y versus Gen Z, for example, Gen Z is much, much more conscious. And if you look at so Gen Z, you know, there's, there's still a very large chunk of Gen Z, which is you know relatively young, but data surveys suggest that they're actually in travel decisions. Those young, the younger end of Gen Z are actually making a lot of the travel decisions for their families. So airlines would do well to take them seriously. Okay, that's a that's a very positive outlook, I would say. Now, if I zoom in a little bit, um, how could this whole thing work, right? Even if airlines take a proactive step, then I always come to the conclusion that if you want to, I don't know, measure and validate, you know, this kind of control avoidance. I see this connection to also the carbon offsetting where, where it was about planting trees. So I see that um, maybe there is a necessity to have a neutral kind of entity or an arbiter, right, who would oversee this, no, I don't want to say ecosystem, but these processes. And from a neutral perspective, however that would be defined, right, then validates if the contrail avoidance was done to the right degree, in the right extent. Do you also see that problem, and how could you envision maybe a solution for that? No, very well phrased. I think I think um, uh, you're you're getting to the right ingredients of a solution already in what in what you just said, Marius. And for for me, there's one critical bridge that needs to be overcome, and this is where research is required. But this is not the early stage. What is the size of the impact of the contrails? This is the medium stage of well, how do you actually mitigate? kind of research, which is what we are very much in favor of, right? Because you can either model the impact that you've had, or you can measure the impact that you've had. But let's remember, if you are successful in mitigating a control, there's nothing there to measure. And we don't have a different version of the world in which actually you did create the country, right? The multiverse. Right? <laughs> yeah. So how how difficult is this to, to really do? Well, this is where I think Mark Shapiro can answer the question far better than me in terms of the efforts that are ongoing to be able to tackle this problem. There needs to, at some point, be an independent view that, yes, airline A says they, they changed their route, they burnt 0. Point blah percent more fuel, and a contrail was not generated. Therefore, they should get that credit. Now, that credit does not necessarily mean a monetary credit, by the way. It just means the recognition. It could be monetized, maybe, but let's just say the recognition for now, right, that we mitigated this contrail. But there does need to be a third party that has trust somehow, uh, that the public trusts and governments trust, and can say, yes, we we affirm that had that trajectory not been changed, a contrail would have been there based on this depth of research that we've or that we that we've done. And clearly, as demonstrated by satellite data, there was no contrail. Therefore, that credit or that recognition is worth it. And that's extremely difficult to do. Now, if I can, if I can simplify the argument for a second, though, going back to the carrot versus stick point from a few minutes ago, if there was just a blanket stick, there shall be no more contrails. This individual measure my exact impact issue goes away. Because at that point, 
individual airlines don't need to get credit. You just need to have no contrails. So going back to that argument, there is actually a great simplicity in the stick of there shall be no more contrails. And if we see one generated, you will be fined versus the carrot approach of, well, we'll very accurately measure and we'll give you a, a little bit of a bonus or an incentive if you're able to demonstrate mitigation. So we also need to measure that up in the carrot versus stick debate. I, I'm glad you uh, now you used also a very good illustration um, with the carrot and stick. Uh, I remember last time you uh, used the metaphor of a scalpel versus a hammer approach, right? And um, yes. and then since we spoke last time and now there was this interesting study from uh, Roger Thiel mm. who actually looked into you know the different regions. Yes. Um, was that something? Is that something that supports your argument? And what kind of solutions does it offer? Um, this this more recent study, uh, which were not there before, maybe. Well, it, it, I think it supports the argument that uh, more directed science and more directed uh, focused uh, focus on solutions is something we can start going for. Uh, that study, if, if I summarize, kind of the the, the the key the two key takeaways that at least I took away from it. Tell me if I missed something that you that you found. But the first one was that. It was able to more accurately get with with smaller error bars the overall global impact of contrails, and it was the midpoint of that was actually a little bit less than the DS Lee study from a few years ago, uh, but it was still firmly within the DS Lee error bars. So it is it's 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 a consistent data point, but it's a bit more precise. That's one. That's very helpful. The second thing is the regional point. That actually the vast majority of warming contrails are apparently over North America and the transatlantic uh, flights. And there tend to be more cooling contrails in Asia Pacific and, and, and in that region, and even a little bit over, over contiguous Europe. What we find then is actually this simplifies the game quite a lot. Because if we are to do trials, we could run those trials over North America and over the transatlantic and be very quickly able to generate helpful conclusions on what kind of mitigation techniques work and which ones don't work at least we can then isolate our research a little bit more effectively. And I think from that perspective, it's an extremely helpful study from, from TO et al. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, and definitely does make sense. Now, looking at the time. Yeah, so I think maybe just to, to wrap things up a little bit, we could ask something around the, the True Zero study. And, and basically, the idea of True Zero is that it's not just CO2 that we're trying to mitigate, it's all of the other non-CO2 effects, so contrails and NOx primarily. So just a question for you, Nikhil, to, to wrap things up. Okay. What do you envisage by 2030 as an uh, intermediate deadline? What do you envisage happening in the aviation industry to push us towards these true zero goals by 2050? Yeah, really interesting. I think, first of all, what do we mean by true zero? It, it's, it's a term that means net zero plus Zero NOx, zero contrails, zero other non-CO2 impacts. Mm -hmm. Aviation is pretty unique. There's not too many industries that burn fossil fuels at 30,000 feet. This is basically the only one, except maybe a little bit of space, space uh, of the space industry, right? Um, and as a result, it needs to be treated separately. Non-CO2 effects are huge. Contrails are but one of them. True zero would see us bringing the total impact to zero. So by 2030, what I want to see ideally is First and foremost, a recognition of the non-CO2 effects by all key players. This is starting to happen, right? The contrail talk, uh, the discussion that we've just been having is the key non-CO2 effect as, as far as we know. And the fact that there's a lot more discussion about that is wonderful. But let's talk about non-CO2 more broadly. Yeah. Let's accept that it exists, number one. And I don't want to wait till 2030 for that. Let's do that in 2024 if we can, right? New, New Year's resolution. <laughs> Second thing I'd love to see happen is genuine action by 2030. Because again, we live in a world with tipping points. I don't want to have to wait. And I, my, my two-year-old kid should not have to wait until 2049 for people to be like, oh, the goal was 2050. Let's do something about it now. No, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it sooner, right? Why, why not? Let's prevent the Siberian methane traps from, from being opened up, yeah. right? So by 2030, I want to see the things that can be actioned, action. Yeah. What are those things, Love right? It. That's what we don't need brand new technologies for. We already have the technology or we're very near to having the technology, such as significant operational improvements, primarily route optimizations to prevent unnecessarily long routes which burn extra fuel, right? That's something we can do today if we are better at coordinating among ourselves. 
This is a human and information problem, not a technological problem. Let's solve that by 2030. And ideally, control mitigation. At least we should have begun doing it at scale by then. It should not just be a question of, well, do we do it or not, which is where we are right now. We should have decided, <laughs> and we should ideally be getting on with it by 2030. That should hopefully put us in a very good position because at least our numbers suggest that if you do those things, when we've done the modeling on this, then you can actually mitigate aviation's impact so significantly, primarily because of how impactful contrails are, that the net impact in GWP 50 terms is global warming potential over 50 years. That net impact can be reduced to below 2019 levels by 2030. So if there's a numerical target, that's the target we should hit. Okay. And at that point, I think aviation will have demonstrated that it's a good corporate or industrial citizen in the world. Yeah. So touching on exactly what you were saying about tipping points and the fact that once we surpass these, it's potentially irreversible changes that will happen. So in the lead up to that and in this crucial time that we have, I just just basically wondering what your opinion is on the idea of, OK, contrail management doesn't quite go to plan. We don't reach these technology goals that we're aiming for. Do you think there's any demand side action that we could take? So potential reduction in demand through maybe frequent flyer levies or aviation taxes? Just wondering what your opinion is on, on that subject, really. No, it's a, it's a really interesting one. I'll, I'll quickly make two points on this. Number one, yeah. it's something that can't be completely ruled out because we do have an industry in which I, I forget the exact statistic. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll correct me. Uh, please put it into the podcast notes if, if what I'm about to say is wrong. But I believe it's something like, you know, the, the top one or two percent of travelers generate 50 percent of the emissions. I think that's correct. <laughs> it's not a great place to be. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm probably one of those top one or two percent. I, I travel a lot. That's not very good. Sure. Right. So we th th there, there is a place for that. Can we mitigate a, a big portion of that 50 percent just by putting, for example, a frequent flyer lobby? I'm not saying that's the best solution, but it's something to be considered. But the counterpoint is. Aviation is not fully democratized. Most parts of the world, outside the Western and the advanced world, is still getting to the air. And we can't have a situation in which, again, we'd have a social injustice happen if this wonderful sector that adds connectivity, adds mobility, improves globalization, improve, improves trade, and actively helps with GDP growth and gross value add is significant, creates jobs. I mean, come on. We can't be saying this industry has to be held back as a global sector. Sure. So yes, let's maybe target people like me who travel too much. Okay, let's do that. But let's not have a negative impact on those that are just getting in the air. Yeah. And let's allow the industry to, to still overall continue growing, which is why I do believe that scientific and technological solutions is where we should be focusing our efforts, not on societal solutions that simply prevent people traveling and meeting their loved ones. Yeah. So it has to be an, an equitable transition. It can't be something which affects the whole world in, in the same way because it's not the whole world that is causing the problem. It's a very small number of people causing the majority of the issue. Exactly right. I think this was a very differentiated note to end this episode with. And I can see in your eyes, Kieran, that there are a thousand more burning questions. But uh, we appreciate you, Nikhil, taking this time so far. I've learned a lot in this episode. And um, we, we spoke about uh, tradition, which we are launching today. So uh, you're experiencing this live. And the tradition is that uh, we always take a question from the previous episode that we take into the current one. I think this was just done by Kieran um, mentioning the demand management because it was a topic that was also um, discussed in a very differentiated uh, manner uh, by Finley, uh, also worth listening to. And I noted down that you also passed one question on to Mark Shapiro, um, which was around the topic of the arbiter of the neutral entity. So there's a check mark right there. Um, we're quite grateful for that. Is there anything beyond the circular SAF study, which I can highly recommend, you find them on uh, Roland Berger website. Is there anything else you'd like our listeners to look into or anything you could recommend? I would simply say the roadmap to true zero continues to be relevant. I think that the latest study by, by, by Roger Tio et al will force us to do an update. I think it's great. I look forward to doing that update in coming months, but the overall conclusions are unchanged even, even with that. So I would I would urge listeners to to read our roadmap to true zero, which is also available on the Roland Berger website. 
I can definitely support that. Very interesting resources. So, Nikhil, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for the time. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you both. And uh, I hope to continue the interaction and uh, listen to, to your future podcasts as well. Yes. Thank you, Nikhil. Thank you. Speak soon, Nikhil. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.